Great, fantastic. Thanks everyone for joining in a little bit early. For those of you who joined in a little bit early, and thank you for everyone again for uh, joining us on yet another exciting presentation. Uh, this is going to be a joint presentation between eGrabber and Deal Builders, and we're going to be presenting on mastering first encounters on sales calls. And that's what we're going to do today. Let me introduce you to the panel that we have on here. We have on the panel today Pete Ekstrom. Now, Pete is the president and CEO of Deal Builders, and he helps companies develop new markets within the financial services industry. And he'll uh, introduce himself a little bit more elaborate as we go on. Pete, welcome aboard. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Great, great. We also have on the call today uh, Clinton Rosario. Clinton is the chief software architect at eGrabber, and he's been instrumental in developing many, many of the exciting tools that eGrabber has on the market today. Clinton, welcome aboard as well. Thank you, Rich. Nice to see you today. Great. Thanks so much. And the voice that you hear, that's me, Rich Kumar. I've been working with eGrabber for about five years now as a customer success manager, and I've had the privilege to train more than 1,000 customers on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's who we have on the call today. Okay? And uh, without further ado, um, I'll hand over the floor to Pete. And before I hand over the floor to Pete, uh, please go ahead and tweet about us if you want to um, tweet to Pete, there's his Twitter handle, there's the Twitter handle for Clinton and for eGrabber tool. Uh, we'll also be monitoring the tweets live, so if you do have any tweets for us, you can also use the hashtag eGrabber webinar, and we'll be doing that as well. All right, let me uh, put you on to Pete. Pete, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and thanks to uh, eGrabber for setting this uh, up today, and welcome to you all. Good morning on the West Coast, and good afternoon on the East Coast, uh, coming to you live from uh, New York in a little uh, South Shore town on Long Island called Massapequa, where I uh, make my office and my home, and uh, I am in my own business. I founded a company 12 years ago called Deal Builders. Uh, after 20 years in technology sales, decided that I'd rather work for myself, so came up with the idea of uh, becoming a surrogate cold caller, so to speak, and uh, making outbound calls to target prospects for my clients and setting up sales appointments over the phone so uh, they can get their foot in the door and on to closing more sales. Uh, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, a discovery of mine several years into my business. I realized that a lot of what used to work with me on the phone with prospects to get my foot in the door and close that ever so important sales appointment to my calendar was really not serving me so well. That's my elevator pitch. I spent hours working for companies rehearsing it. Uh, the materials that I got from the companies I work for, uh, some of these scripts read like a book. Uh, and some of them had the arrows and kind of when the prospect says this, you say that and this, whatever. I had it down pat, so when I started out my own business, deal builders. Um, it was just a natural progression for me to get into the business of making outbound calls, and the elevator pitch served me well. I think there was a, a paradigm shift, I'm going to call it. <laughs> um, I would say sometime around 10 years ago, okay? Now, I've been at this a while. I have gone door-to-door -door co calling I've co called over the phone, and I noticed that the attention span of the average prospect, which was, you know, thin, <laughs> and short to begin with was getting shorter. So I was explaining to my prospect the nature of the business that I represented, the product, uh, its possible value, uh, use third-party customer references, all in an effort to elevate the importance of value of myself, to highlight myself, to uh, help the prospect see that it was uh, you know, worth their time to talk to me. All right, now it worked. Uh, I'm going to say I didn't, uh, it was shut out. Uh, it served me well. But it just seemed to be different. Something happened. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I think that we are in the attention economy today. And attention is at a premium. Uh, people uh, now with the advent of uh, electronic communication, everything's texting, email, right away. You know, We're in a fast-paced society. And we're also in an information age where the volume of information that we all have to pay attention to on any given day is just you know, far beyond our ability to really pay attention to it all. So 
we have a prejudice towards the information that we receive, either in spoken form, written form, or text, or tweets, and we make a split-second decision to either pay attention or not pay attention, okay? And prospects are people, too, <laughs> and they go through this uh, first impression of a salesperson that they take a phone call from, and they are deciding uh, what to pay attention to. So. And this all happens very, very, very quickly. So in an effort to protect their attention from being stolen by salespeople, prospects are protecting their attention like it was currency, like it was money. So that's why I call it the attention economy, because attention is really the currency that drives business. The companies that are experts at attracting attention in a split second are the companies that are going to be immensely successful in the market. There's no doubt about it. So if you look at advertising today and um, click ads and things like that, you, you, are, you are coming in contact with a new age of advertising and marketing, which is all designed to hook your attention instantaneously. And that's what I found was going wrong for me. The prospects of today in the 21st century have little patience and little time for that long two or three or four paragraph sales call script that the company has given you. Uh, not only is it difficult to memorize, but I'm sure if you read it over the phone, you sound like a robot. And if you sound monotonous in the tone of your voice and use the typical grammar and vocabulary that cold calling salespeople typically use when they try to uh, garner the attention of a prospect, you have tripped the attention filter of your prospect and your sales call, unfortunately, is on a slippery slope and going downstream. And then the chase is on, trying to get that attention back with more features and benefits and value proposition statements and so on. But that ship has already sailed. Once you lose the prospect's attention, it's very unlikely you're going to get it back. After all, we're talking about currency, people's money. That's what attention is. So I had found a study on ABC World News tonight several years ago that uh, was a study put on by a psychologist, a professor, Dr. Nalini Ambati from Tufts University, and she also did a study at Harvard on just how much time does it take for an average human being to draw a first impression conclusion of another. Now, following our uh, webinar today, our show, uh, I'm happy to... Uh, respond back to you with a link to the specific article that will explain it in more detail. But let me sum it up by saying this. The average human being in the 21st century on site, like I'm looking at someone, I can draw a first impression conclusion of that individual in two seconds. Two. One, two, and I got you all sized up. On the, on the sound of your voice and how you, you carry yourself in conversation, you get a little bit more, okay? but it's only about five to 10 seconds. So in other words, in the span of anywhere from two to 10 seconds, your prospect has already sized you up and drawn a first impression conclusion of you just based on the sound of your voice, the grammar, the vocabulary you use, your manner of speech. That's what I want to call your attention to today. You should not underestimate the power of the tone of your voice and how you carry yourself in conversation, hopefully with a great degree of confidence. All right, we'll talk about that in a second. But in that two to 10 seconds, which is not a lot of time, right? Um, you have got to have a profound impact on that prospect's attention and pull that attention in your direction. And the best way to do that is to stop sounding like a salesperson. They have heard it before dozens and dozens of times, so they're prejudiced. So all of a sudden, it's you calling, and my name is Bill, and I work with ABC Company, and we help companies like yours who are experiencing problems in their back office with inventory control problems, and we, we, you know, so on and so forth. You know the deal. That has got to come to an end, especially if we're going to succeed in capturing the attention of prospects. So if you've seen that movie, too, chances are you don't want to go see it again, and that's the impression that prospects have about the typical standard elevator pitch sales call. So I had to change things up. If I was going to stay in business and get enough closed sales appointments on my calendar, something needed to change. I needed to put the cart behind the horse. I needed to save value, features, benefits, the colors it came in, the people I do business with, all of that 
filler stuff till later on. Time is running out, and I want to make the best possible first impression of myself to a prospect. I want to master the first encounter that I have in spontaneous conversation with prospects in order to be an expert prospector and give myself a better chance of getting my foot in the door. And when we're in front of prospects and we're able to ask questions and carry on a conversation about the problem and what we might do to solve it, you'll find that your sales cycles will collapse, they'll get shorter, and you'll also be able to get to decision makers much faster because questions drive conversation. We're going to talk about that in a second. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me start first things first, all right? Now, for those of you that are millennials, young people probably don't recognize this picture. This is an old picture. This goes all the way back to the uh, 1920s uh, with uh, the creation of a company called RCA Victor, all right, which uh, was the first marketing arm of the phonograph, okay? They actually manufactured the thing, and when records uh, first came out or whatever, this was... Uh, a dog that was heeding his master's call. So that's why I use it here, all right? Paying attention and listening, okay? But the prospect is listening to you when you call, but they're not paying attention. That's the point here, all right? Listening and paying attention are two entirely different things, all right? So what your prospect, unfortunately for you, what they're listening to is they're waiting for you to screw up, all right? They're waiting for you to say a phrase to use a word to describe your product or your business that they've heard before and they wait for you to get tongue-tied in conversation and sound unconfident or have a lack of confidence in conversation. That's when they pounce with the objection. If you want to know where it comes from, you are tipping your hand to the prospect with an elevator pitch, talking like 10,000 other salespeople. The prospect listens for that and then they pounce. Uh, do you have anything you can send me? Right? How long have you been in business? Who else do you do work for? All of these questions are draw questions to draw you away from the focus of your call into their world where they can have their way with you and bombard you with objections and a mounted resistance to your call. So the first thing in mastering first encounters in spontaneous conversations with prospects, you have to realize that there is a difference between listening and paying attention. And more than likely, your prospect is listening, but they're not paying attention because they don't know you well enough to draw that first impression conclusion that you are worthy of their attention. So that's what we're striving for. Next slide, please. Here we go. All right, so we're talking about how to start spontaneous conversation and master that first encounter. First of all, if you're nervous, you're in trouble, all right? <laughs> Let me just say this. If you're nervous, when a prospect answers the phone, and I kind of laugh, you know, it's like when I make a cold call or back in the old days, uh, everything was great while the phone was ringing, right? And then I got voicemail, I got the greeting, and then I would breathe a sigh of relief, you know, dodged a bullet, didn't have to talk to the prospect and feel nervous. But the nerves build, the war of nerves is your biggest enemy when you want to strike up a spontaneous conversation with a prospect, right? Because if you're nervous and you put forth a uh, first impression of yourself as someone who's not confident in what they represent for themselves, I mean, who's going to find you interesting? Who's going to find me interesting? Nobody. People like to talk to people that sound confident, that they're on, on level ground and speaking with confidence and know how to articulate and pace their speech and not talk forever. But the most important thing is that you need to realize is that 75% of what it takes to get your foot in the door and meeting with a sales prospect comes in the sound of your voice, your speech mannerism. If you are confident, you will make other people feel confident. If you are uncomfortable, believe me, if you have a lack of confidence, the prospect is wincing. They're like, ooh, boy, I'm so glad I didn't become a salesperson, right? <laughs> and so if you're nervous, it shows. It really does. And if you're nervous, you just come across the prospect as someone who's not worthy of attention. And that's why prospects are so prejudiced against you, where they will discard you quickly with a request for more sales literature, or they ask you if you have a website. You know, you got something I can look at on the web, right? And who owns the conversation at that point? The prospect does. 
and now the battle to regain control of the call is on, and boy, can that frustrate a salesperson. Because the more you speak, the faster you speak, and perhaps at some point you lose track of what you're saying, and then you're nervous about what's going to happen after you finish talking to the prospect, and the whole thing just unravels like a ball of yarn thrown across the floor. <laughs> and it's anybody's guess how to put it back, to again, back together again. So my question to you, are you nervous on cold calls? If you are, you should know in advance that you are doing something wrong. If you're nervous, the prospect is going to recognize it and they're going to have their way with you and we don't want that to happen. Next slide, please. Okay, so I wanted to get into some of the reasons why you are nervous. So if you ask your question, why am I nervous? Well, the lack of confidence I just covered, right? Where does it come from? The lack of confidence is not having a plan. Okay, if you don't know what to say in the introduction of yourself to a prospect, and it just rambles on. You're reading off of that script the company gave you. All right. Sooner or later, you're going to run out of gas, just like a balloon that runs out of air. Everything's okay at the beginning, but you let go of the balloon, and God knows where it's going to land. So if you work the process in terms of constructing your dialogue and what you want to say in the opening seconds, remember, we got two to ten seconds here to capture somebody's attention, so we better nail it right away. There's no second chances at a great first impression. So if you don't have a plan and you don't know what to say and if you are not thinking ahead as to what the reply is going to be from a prospect and have a follow-up question, you are just basically going through the motions of speaking and are totally unprepared and caught off guard with the response that you're going to get from a prospect. And that's why we all hate objections because it usually the objection catches us off guard or the request to send sales literature. So. You're nervous because you don't have a plan in place, a structured dialogue. And you really have to have a structured dialogue today with people. There isn't enough time to master the first encounter within 10 seconds when you don't have a plan, a dialogue plan and know what you want to say, and most importantly, how to say it. The second thing that I see is that a lot in salespeople is they don't have a passion. Okay? Now, I don't know if it's you. I don't know you well enough to say for sure. but. There are some people who are in sales just for the salary. Not quite sure about the business that they're in, not quite sure about the product that they're selling, probably uh, don't have an idea as to why anybody in their right mind would buy their product, but every two weeks the check is in the mail or they get direct deposit, maybe a little draw on top of that to make things nice. And as soon as that draw runs out, they're out with a resume looking for another sales job where they'll repeat the process. And a lot of people in the sales profession treat their career accordingly. So they don't have a passion. You've got to have a burning desire to want to meet and greet people and feel some sense of accomplishment that you were able to start from a dead stop a conversation with a complete stranger and carry that conversation to an end point of decision. And to be a master of first encounters with prospects, you should be on track to getting an end point of decision, whether that's yes or no. Inside the span of four minutes, if your conversation has legs and it's driving forward and you are in control of the call, you can get to a decision with any prospect you come in contact with. But without passion, without a love for speaking, without some sense of excitement about the challenge of kind of like treasure hunting, right? Isn't that what prospecting really is? I, mean, I don't know where the buried treasure is, but I'm sure excited about the effort. So that's why I go out there with my pickaxe and shovel, and I dig in a spot that I think there's some buried treasure. So if you're unwilling to embrace the unknown, if you don't have a passion for process, and really have a focused um, interest in developing your speaking skills, then you lack the passion to come across in, an, in a way that's attention worthy to prospects. And then what do they do? They quickly discard you and ask you to send information. So you're nervous because no confidence, probably because you're unprepared. And if you don't have a passion for the job, you better find it or else you're going to sound like a typical salesperson, not worthy of attention. And that's not a good thing. Next slide. Here we go. All right, so I didn't ask you to come here today and just listen to me 
you know, browbeat you over what you're doing wrong. Look, we're, I'm, I'm fallible too, all right? I've had my fair share of calls go wrong, right? But I have a passion about fixing it, right? So I sought answers to my problem. I didn't like being nervous on calls. I didn't like being lost in conversation. And I certainly didn't like being thought of as a fool and taken advantage of by prospects. So I wanted to do something about it. So I happened to find a, uh, a, a, res a solution, that's what I'm trying to say, in Toastmasters, okay? Now, I had heard about Toastmasters for years, um, but just couldn't find myself to a local public library to come and attend a one-hour meeting to find out what my problem with speaking was and what I can do about it to boost my confidence, all right? Now, I have a gift of gab, and I basically can talk to just about anybody, but I have to tell you, in a constructive sales negotiating environment, I was old. I was nervous. I was too left feet. And I can remember a, a, a conference that I was a key speaker. <laughs> I was completely choked up and I couldn't speak because I wasn't as prepared and passionate about the material I was going to be speaking about. And that's when I found my way to a Toastmasters club. The next day, I searched uh, Toastmasters.org, Toastmasters.org. have a little search uh, capability there where you can enter in your zip code or your town or whatever. It will deliver back a list of clubs that meet in your area. And most of these clubs are open to the general public, although major corporations like IBM and Oracle and Microsoft have their own club, which is only open to uh, employees. But for the most part, you will find a search return of a list of Toastmasters Club meetings. And uh, I found the Toastmasters. You don't have to talk on a Toastmasters meeting, uh, during a Toastmasters meeting. Okay, You can go there and be a fly on the wall. All right, just to kind of get a sense for what the program is all about. But it is by far a structured program that takes an amateur speaker and turns them into a competent speaker and takes a competent speaker and helps them accelerate their skills and improve their skills so they become an advanced speaker. And that's really where you want to be in business, is become an advanced speaker and master that first encounter you have with everyone you come in contact with in business. So I think what you'll find is a complete description of the programs, et cetera, et cetera. You will find that up on Toastmasters.org. Get to a meeting. To not be an expert speaker in this economy that we have right now, the attention economy, you're cheating yourself. You're just out there trying to wear down the rock of Gibraltar with erosion. It's going to take forever. I want to accelerate your ability to get your foot in the door, put one foot in front of the other, and command the respect and the attention of other people, at least to get to an end point of decision so there's no mystery. Okay, You know exactly where you stand with another person. I got my passion from a book I read uh, by Tony Robbins. This is an old book. This thing has been around since the early 80s. Uh, but I have to tell you, the material is his best book. And uh, it really gets into the, pas the passion and developing a passion for excellence. Okay, And if you're going to do anything, whether it be a sales job, or you're a plumber, or a carpenter, or uh, an electrician, or whatever it is that your vocation is, you want to do it the best that you possibly can. I mean, if you have a passion for that and want to achieve greatness, I don't think anybody's out there to be, you know, half good. You'd like to be all good. You'd like to be 100% top of your game, okay? So this book, Unlimited Power, helped me come to a greater awareness of what I was doing wrong, but really what it needed, what I needed to do on a daily basis to uh, get my adrenaline flowing and develop the passion that I need to drive conversation with confidence. I would rather spend the time reading a book or going to a Toastmasters meeting than spend my time typing up a resume and sitting in waiting rooms uh, while I'm waiting on a job interview. Okay, The choice is yours. Uh, there's difficulty in earning a good living. There's difficulty in earning a bad living. I'd rather suffer the difficulty of earning a good living. So I decided to concentrate my efforts, and I would highly recommend that you do, to uh, get yourself on track some sort of a support group. I found these, uh, the Toastmasters and Unlimited Power to help me. Last but not least, the best thing I I'd ever did was to start recording my phone conversations. All you need to understand your ability as a speaker, as a communicator, is to get a little handheld digital voice recorder from Olympus. That's the one I use. And it's about 35 bucks. And when you build your call script, and in my world, it's the gold call script. And to speak it, 
you play it back, you can listen to your own voice. Now, I know that that might sound a little odd at first, listening to your own voice, because you're going to feel a little uncomfortable. But it's going to teach you something, okay? It's going to give you the prospect's perspective of you as a speaker. That's what changed the whole thing for me, because when I started recording my calls, I'd play it back, and I was like, oh, I had to hold my nose. God, did I think? I was a terrible salesperson and horrible with the elevator pitch. I had two left feet, to say the least. So, again, recognizing the penalties and the cost of the problem, I opted for a solution. And listening to my call recordings helped me understand uh, the problem I had and what I needed to do to polish my speech and become a more competent speaker. Up on my website, thegoldcall.com, that's thegoldcall.com, I have uh, posted some sample call recordings that I've had with real prospects over the phone. The calls you're about to hear are true. Their names and the companies they work for have been withheld to protect their identity. And uh, so you can listen to those calls as to get an idea as to how I, sp I start spontaneous conversation with a prospect, how I apply humor in the opening seconds of the call, to win favor for my prospect and get their attention. So check it out if you'd like. And I think if you put these three uh, components together, Toastmasters, Unlimited Power, and my Gold Call Recordings, I think you're going to come to a greater awareness as to uh, what it takes to successfully master first chance encounters with other people and master uh, the prospecting effort. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's my gift to you today, all right? And we can repeat this a little later on. You can contact me personally, all right? I want you to start thinking about, remember the stopwatch, right? You got two to ten seconds to strike a chord with a prospect. So you better make it good and you got to nail it, right? So you, you have confidence when you know what to say and how to start the conversation. Then you're unbeatable. You can't be knocked off balance. So what I decided to do was forego that salesy talk that company script is just absolutely terrible. And start with a question. This question that you see here is how I start my, it's a, it's a request, okay? Let me, let me phrase that properly. It's a request for the 10 seconds I need to explain my call. All right, that's how all conversations with complete strangers should start over the phone. This is James with SGI, and I'm hoping you'll give me the 10 seconds I need to explain my call. That's how you have to start conversation with people today. Or, this is James with SGI. We don't know each other, but I'm hoping I might have 10 seconds to ask a question. Now, let me, let me explain what's going on here, okay? Now, I know that old habits die hard, and I understand that it's going to be a little difficult to go from what it is that you're saying to prospects now and make it really pithy in the form of a soundbite request for 10 seconds, and I'm going to explain to you why. Now, the thing is, when you call a prospect, they don't know you. I think that's a, a foregone conclusion. They don't know who you are. You're Sally, you're Mark, you're John, you're Desiree, you're whoever. And then suddenly comes the name of the company, and now perhaps you get into a value proposition. That's what's wrong with the elevator pitch. As soon as you tell a prospect what's for sale and what it's about, their attention evaporates by 50%. Now you're dealing with half-life of a battery from 100% when you started, now to, now you're only running on two cylinders here, all right? Your call is about to die of a heart attack if you're going to use this value proposition to start a call with a prospect. So what I do is first things first, right? Never, ever assume that the prospect is paying attention. They may be listening. Remember I told you, but they're not paying attention. In order for me to give life to conversation, my prospect has to pay attention to me. So I've got to draw them in in a different way that they haven't heard of before. And differences, okay, let me say this again, differences attract attention. So if you dare to be different in conversation, you are going to tra attract attention. And this is how I do it. And you'll hear me on every call recording that I make with a prospect. This is Pete Action with Deal Builders. And I'm hoping you'll give me the 10 seconds to explain my call. Now the key word in here is the word hoping. Okay, and this gets down to interpersonal communications. If you are willing, as a human being, to let the other guy win, let other people go first, to hold the door, extend a courtesy, you 
are a rarity in today's society. Courtesy is in short supply. So the, the reason why I underline the word hoping is because it extends a courtesy to the prospect. I'm hoping that you'll give me the 10 seconds I That's their fear, the unknown. They don't know how long this sales pitch is going to go on. And if you take a look at that sales script that your company gave you, boy, that thing, it takes about two or three minutes just to recite it. So I want my prospect to give me, to grant me, the 10 seconds I need to explain my call or ask a quick question. So this is defined as the icebreaker. In all spontaneous conversations with prospects, in order to capture their attention and create the best possible first impression of yourself, you need to be courteous, put a frame around the amount of time it takes to get to the point, and what you'll find with this icebreaker, it's going to calm the prospect's defenses. Calm the prospect's defenses, which is what you want to do. A defensive prospect is not a good prospect. Not at all. You don't want to put people, you don't, the first impression you give to other people is not to put them on the defensive and get them to start worrying about you what's going to happen next, how long is this going to last, right? So we cut to the chase. This is James with SGI, and I'm hoping, I want to accent that in your speech delivery, I'm hoping, right, you'll give me the 10 seconds I need to explain my call, or 10 seconds to ask a question. And now you have developed, inadvertently, without being obvious about it, you have developed a level, a degree of rapport that you did not have before and that no other salesperson working for your competitor is going to be successful in doing. So you've got the upper hand because you have extended a courtesy and put a time limit. And most importantly, you get to the point you don't sound like a salesperson. And that's, if there's anything you get out of my uh, presentation today, is that you've got to stop talking like everybody else. Differences attract attention. The same old, same old is boring. You've got to sound interesting to some degree, and you don't have to be as humorous as I am or off the cuff as I am or whatever. You just have to be yourself. Relax, okay? I want you to picture in your mind that you're meeting around the barbecue grill on Memorial Day, and you just happen to meet a neighbor you haven't met yet who just moved into the neighborhood, and there you are, right? Simple question. The 10 seconds it takes to explain the call. All right. Next slide, please. As I get into the anatomy of conversation, conversational dialogue in the 21st century, because it works completely different from anything you've read or anything you've heard anywhere else. It's different today because we're in the attention economy. So we've got to be careful how we choose our words, speak our words, so that it has maximum effect on the prospect that we're talking to. So we've gotten through the icebreaker. And this is how I look at dialogue or a sales call today, right? Now, I use an upside-down triangle because all conversations start generically. Hello, my name is Pete, okay? <laughs> Generic conversation. And as we move through dialogue,